Good morning, saints. Hope you're all doing well this Lord's Day. It's an important day for us as a local church, uh, making important decisions, weighty decisions. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be up here um, before you all. Like Brett said, family, uh, whom I love dearly, who I know loves me dearly, and uh, it's just a very sweet and precious thing. So, very thankful for that. We're going to be in Second uh, Timothy four one through five. Second Timothy four one through five, and I'll give you a minute to turn there. Um, and as you are turning there, uh, let me just set the stage a little for you. It is the year AD 64. It's been 29 years since Christ uttered those words, those perplexing words regarding his servant, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now in his final days of suffering, Paul sits in a cold, damp Roman prison cell waiting for his last trial. He faces two false charges against him, one for the recent burnings of Rome, Second, attempting to change social customs, challenging imperial authority. And he has virtually been forsaken by all his friends, except for Luke. So the reality, uh, while the reality of martyrdom looms around the corner, uh, he, he sits in these final moments and writes one last inspired letter to his beloved Timothy. So again, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, hear now the word of the Lord. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Pray with me as we ask God's blessing on today's word. Our glorious and great Father, once more we do uh, come to you in prayer. Lord, for a weighty task to preach, to hear, to grow, to gain from your word, which is living and active and sharp, that cuts, that heals, that supplies all that we need. And so, God, I pray for strength, for help, for clarity and confidence to to be faithful to you in this. Uh, It's by your strength alone we can do these things. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these saints. God, you have provided uh, a wonderful body of believers here, and so I just praise you and thank you that we um, can gather in your name, we can, we can worship you, and we can learn and gain from your glorious, great word to us. So, Lord, we lift these things up to you in Jesus' mighty name, amen. <clears throat> well, it's believed by some that when Julius Caesar made it over to the shores of Britain uh, with his troops in 55 B.C., He did something quite unexpected to ensure the success of his military venture. His men were ordered to the edge of the cliffs of Dover and commanded to look down on the water. And to their amazement, all their ships in which they had crossed the channel were in flames, cutting off any possibility of retreat. Uh, Nothing was left for them to do but to move forward in total commitment to the conquest. Uh, In that story, whether totally true or not, is there are similar stories of other military ventures Uh, where they did use that tactic. It's even in a military tactic uh, teaching book. In the Christian life, and especially in military or ministry, uh, retreating from the God-given goal is the path to destruction. There's nothing uh, to gain going backwards. The Bible, of course, has much to say about this. Uh, Lot's wife looked back, and it resulted in devastation for her. Saul had lacked obedience and lost the kingdom. Jesus said, whoever puts his hand in the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. We all face that temptation of wanting to turn back 
to the path of least resistance, especially in trying times of suffering and difficulty. But forward is our only path uh, in safety. Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize, or for the prize, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, So what is needed for this upward call? Well, the glorious grace of our God. Only the supply of God's free grace can create in us total commitment to press on in the faith and never retreat from the goal. And does God give such grace? He does. 2 Peter 1, 3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. So that is good news for us today, for the subject that is before us, that God's grace grants the things He requires. That's all things. That would include much-needed commitment for you and for, for myself, for all of us, to uh, follow Christ, such that the Christian and the minister can sing those faithful words, I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, I still will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. That should be all of our attitudes in the Christian faith. Last week we heard about the shepherd's call. This week, the shepherd's charge. Um, Specifically, his charge to preach. Uh, As we'll see today, the pastor has a most solemn duty before God to preach the word. To this great task, the preacher must give total commitment. So my proposition before you is simply this. Faithful preaching demands total commitment. Faithful preaching demands total commitment. Three unbending reasons faithful preaching demands total commitment. Uh, First, because that's what's required by God. Second, because that's what's needed by the church. And third, because that's what's necessary to defeat threats. So firstly then, faithful preaching demands total commitment because that's what's required by God. I think this is clearly shown by the weight behind the charge given. So look with me again at verse 1. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Do you feel the weight there? The first thing about this charge given is that it's in the presence of Almighty God. And the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the royal king of all the earth, the one who has all authority and to whom all obedience is due. He gives his divine signet stamp upon this charge. Next it says, as we continue to read, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. So we see secondly that this order to Timothy is given in light of Christ's second coming. This focuses in on the sobering fact that indeed one day all must give an account for their time on earth. All that's been done with all that's been given, there will be an accounting. There is a coming judgment. And this truth must be preached often, must be preached faithfully. As the missionary had said, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat. You see, nothing escapes the watchful eye of God, especially that which takes place in his name. We live in a day where people take the name of Christ and the name of of God lightly. It's taken in vain uh, all the time. Um, People will give an account for every careless word, how much more so that which is done in his name in vain. God's ministers must always keep before them how seriously their master takes uh, faithful preaching and teaching of his word to his church. Teachers, we are told, and James will have a stricter judgment. Those who preach God's word are under the omniscient scrutiny of their chief shepherd. Again, this charge is given in the presence of God and in light of the judgment to come. And so we see something of the weight behind it. Yes, faithful preaching demands total commitment because that's what's required by God. Paul has already exhorted Timothy earlier in this letter to such required uh, total commitment when he said in chapter 2, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer 
who ought to have the first share of the crops, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So a serious responsibility uh, has been entrusted to Timothy, and he is required to employ it faithfully. And such is true of every minister of God's word. Much is given, much will be required. Total commitment is not optional. In today's world, it's hard to to look around and find a good example of this level of commitment called for. Uh, Any kind of serious commitment seems to be uh, diminishing. uh, It's a diminishing quality um, before uh, that we see today. Um, But one picture we do still have that we can look to is that of your typical police officer who's out there on duty. He's fully suited up. His vehicle is clearly identifying him as law enforcement. He's got his orders firmly in mind, and he seeks to perform them faithfully. He carries himself in such a way that demonstrates how seriously he takes his job. He is committed. Why? Because he knows the serious weight of his charge. The responsibilities that are upon his shoulders, what is required of him. He has taken an oath before witnesses to support the Constitution of the United States, their state, and the laws of their agency's jurisdiction. And his commitment to such things drives him forward in the line of duty. Well, there's one that towers, that vastly towers all else in faithfulness to duty. One who never retreated from the goal. Who set his face like flint to to storm the enemy's lines in obedience to the Father. No force could deter him from his mission. With unflinching commitment, he fulfilled the work he was sent to do. The work that has become the very foundation of our faith and hope. The one who is the chief cornerstone of his church. Yes, come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See our Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. The Alpha, the Omega, the First, in the last, the beginning, and the end, the chief shepherd and bishop of our souls. Oh, church, that is our glorious Christ. And he has given officers with their charge to perform their duty to his church, seeking in some small way to imitate their master. God's word says in Ephesians, He gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ. Christ has provided us here at FBC uh, one to this office, our Pastor Brett. As such, he's been given this charge that we are considering today, just as Timothy was, in the presence of Almighty God to preach the word. And Brett, by God's grace, has shown his total commitment to it. And as Paul and I are put forward as elder candidates, if we are installed, we'll be given such a charge. Total commitment will be called for, will be demanded. Thankfully, God gives what he requires. Though his, presen- uh, though his presence and the thought of Judgment Day are sobering, his presence is actually the greatest blessing to his people and the very source of their strength. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually, says the psalmist. Face there means presence. Seek the Lord in his presence. Paul testifies to this great truth when he says a little bit further down in our chapter in 2 Timothy, In verse 16, it says, At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. Verse 17 says, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Yes, God's presence is sobering again, uh, but his glorious presence is our source of strength to persevere. So may our church keep these things in mind for what's ahead and pray for such ministry uh, to flourish as well as uh, to hold leadership accountable to such a high duty. As we'll see next, uh, your spiritual health depends on it. So we've looked at this weighty commitment as that which is required by God. Now let's consider why it's required by God uh, in our second point. Uh, Faithful preaching demands total commitment because that's what's needed by the church. We can see this by looking at what action the charge is to. Let's continue to read uh, here in verse 2, Timothy chapter 4. It says, 
Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. This charge is to preach, to proclaim, to declare or announce, to herald a message. Let's consider the importance of this as it relates to the church. First, by looking at what uh, specifically it is to be preached. Second, to what end. And thirdly, how it is to be done. So firstly, what specifically is to be preached? Well, it is the word. Preach the word. Not man's word, God's word. Second Peter 1, 20-21 says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is not man's opinion. It's, it's God's holy word. Yes, he uses human instrument. He used it human instruments, but in such a way that we have the exact authoritative word given to us in the Bible. And it's an incredible fact to consider. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, Timothy, or, um, says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture, not some, not most, but every word, is profitable. That which comforts where needed, as well as that which greatly challenges and wounds where needed. The law and the gospel. And it is profitable to whom? To God's people. To you and to me. We all need it and we need all of it. Amen? David says in the Psalms, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. Job says, I've not departed from the commands of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. God's word contains all that the church needs. It's doctrines to inform. It's good rules to guide. It's warnings that caution. It's sure promises that comfort. Our every true need finds grace there. It is there we see our desperate need. It is there we see our dependable Savior revealed and offered to us by faith for receiving. Again, it is the sufficient word of God that must be preached. That is the clear and firm order given. Not one's own thoughts or ideas, not one's own natural inclinations and abilities. Uh, John MacArthur, I I found helpful here to that point. Uh, He says there are gifted orators who can sway an audience with the power of their persuasive rhetoric. There are men who are erudite, knowledgeable, well-trained, and worldly wise who can cause other men to change their minds about certain matters. There are men who can relate moving stories that tug at hearts, hearers' hearts and move them emotionally. Throughout the history of the church, including our own time, God has chosen to endow some ministries with such abilities. But God also has chosen not to bless every faithful preacher in those particular ways. Nevertheless, he charges them with the same task of preaching his word. Because the spiritual power and effectiveness of preaching does not rest in the skill of the speaker, but in the truth. So it is the content. Secondly, let's consider what end is scripture profitable. It is profitable in equipping for good works. God's word is to equip every believer for every good work. Recall again our earlier passage in Ephesians 4, 10 through 12. Preaching and teaching is to minister the word so as to equip the saints. To build them up in their faith and to grow their obedience in the things God requires. To go from hearers of the word to doers of the word. It's easy to hear things. It's harder to do things, right? James 1.22 says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So everybody in Christ has been called to carry out good works. Amen? Those good works must be carried out faithfully. 
And the good news is God has given the means by which we are to do them. He doesn't say just, all right, go do these good works and I'm going to see how you do without my help. He's with us. He's the with us God, Emmanuel, and he's helping us along the way. And he uses the word to equip and, and by his spirit enable us toward good works. So how are, we, how are we to walk in these good works? Again, it is only by the word of God. That's how faith came, came to us. And I say this verse a lot, but repetition is good. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. So hearing, faith comes. Hearing what? The word of Christ. That's also how faith is sustained. What is begun by hearing the word? Your faith is sustained by hearing the word. The regular feeding on the word. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. We are fed food from the mouth of the Father, His spoken and inscripturated word. That's also how we receive the Holy Spirit. In, a day, in our day today, we often have the Holy Spirit sort of pit against the word. It's kind of like a word emphasis uh, group of, of teachers, preachers, get accused of lacking the spirit. And those who are emphasizing the spirit all the time are, are being accused of not being faithful to the word. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit inspired the word. The word is, is spirit given. And it's the spirit that does equip us and enable us to do what? Obey the word. Never fall for that false dichotomy. This is a, a spirit, living, breathing word. And we need both. We need the spirit who inspired it to enable us to obey it. That's... Uh, Paul says in Galatians, how did you receive the Spirit? By the works of the law? Was it by your religious obedience? Was it by your good works, your righteousness that you received the Holy Spirit? No. You received the Holy Spirit by hearing with faith. Hearing what? The Word of Christ. And so that's what uh, we need to keep in mind when we're, when we're having those kind of studies and conversations. First. Thessalonians 2.13 speaks of the word of God as that which is at work in you believers. And I really like that verse there it, it, because it challenges me to think about the word in that living, active way. Is It's in the heart. If, if the word is not in your heart, it's, it's, not, it's not working on you. It needs to work into you and it needs to work through you. That's what's so important about the word. The word especially preached is the primary means of, of, of that, that grace that, that answers to our desperate need for grace to, to go on in Christ, to keep our faith, and to continue with God in the path of obedience. Uh, Carl R. Truman says, Preaching the word is a means of grace. It's how grace comes to us under the blessing of the Spirit. In fact, the primary means of grace. It is the means God has appointed for bringing His gracious purpose to fruition in the lives of the men and women who make up the church. God acts first and foremost in the proclamation from the pulpit of his mighty saving acts. And so we ought to amen that church. Even in a day that, that downplays the importance of the word, downplays the importance of the local church, downplays the importance of the pulpit ministry, we as seeking to be a biblical church that values those things ought to amen uh, the importance of or being told the importance of, of God's word being proclaimed to his church. This is how God works grace into us. 2 Corinthians 9 8 says God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. Okay that's talking about God and all of his grace but we just heard how all of scripture is profitable to us for every good work. So do you see the connection there between God's word and grace? It is the preaching of the sufficient word that builds up the church that it may be healthy in holiness and carrying out her mission in good works. Thirdly, how is this preaching to be done? Uh, back to our text here. Uh, it says in verse 2, with readiness in season and out, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with complete patience and teaching or doctrine. The Amplified Bible version, I think, helpfully puts that verse this way. Preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right and even when it is not. Keep your sense of urgency 
whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or unwelcome. Correct those who err in doctrine or behavior, warn those who sin, exhort and encourage those who are growing towards spiritual maturity with inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching. This is what is required from the pulpit. This is what is needed because the scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Therefore, it must be put to full use, right? Uh, the soldier must be committed to the use of his weapon in moments of battle. The doctor must be committed to the use of his knowledge of medicine to effectively administer healing. The farmer needs to be committed to his tilling and the skills needed for that. So the pastor must be committed to delivering God's word for the end of good works in all its facets of use. In this way, then, the minister is to watch over, feed, lead, and guard those souls entrusted to his care as a shepherd watches over his sheep. So may we then be a church here, uh, having this central view of God, uh, this central view of his word, and the importance of faithful preaching. Mark Dever has a quote, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is Louis Burkhoff. He says, strictly speaking, it may be said that the true preaching of the word and its recognition uh, as the standard of doctrine and life is the one mark of the church. Without it, there is no church. God's word created the world. God's word creates the church. God words, God's word sustains the world. God's word sustains the church. Uh, Mark, Mark Dever put, put it this way, pastors teaching the word is the core of a church's discipling ministry. It provides the food and water that feeds all other discipling relationships within the church. And is that our view? Thankfully, I believe it is. We, we emphasize that a lot. Faithful preaching demands total commitment because that's what's needed by the church. Total commitment to preaching and, I want to add, faithfulness to the hearing of the preaching. This is a two-ended deal, right? Faithful preaching, faithful hearing. In light of this fact, it should not come to us, uh, the, in light of the importance of this ministry, it should not come to us as a surprise that such ministry is often the central target of enemy attack. Which leads me to my third and final point. Faithful preaching demands total commitment because that's what's necessary to defeat threats. Because that's what's necessary to defeat threats. I think this can be seen clearly by what Timothy is warned of. And the thing exhorted to in the following verses. So let's continue reading in verse 3 through 5. It says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, to fulfill your ministry. So first, what threats here are warned of? Well, Paul says a time is coming when sound, healthy doctrine and accurate instruction that actually challenges hearers with God's truth will no longer be endured. It will no longer be tolerated. The old gospel and ancient truths of scripture won't hold people's attention and affection and allegiance anymore. Such people's corruptions will outgrow their convictions. And what follows? Turning away from truth. From what is from what is good, healthy, and sound, to that which is unstable, being greedy for ear-tickling false teaching that suits their sin. The rule of sin will uh, rule out, so to speak, the rule of conviction and obedience. And as Jesus, our Lord, plainly warns, you cannot serve two masters. Full devotion will either be given to the one or to the other. There is no in-between. The Amplified Bible again puts that verse we read this way, wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors they hold, and will turn their ears away from the truth and will wander off into myths and man-made fictions and will accept the unacceptable. Interestingly, and I want us to hear this point. This just jumped right out at me when I was preparing. Interestingly, the emphasis here is on false hearers before false teachers. It's easy to attack all the false teachers out there. We all do that. But how often are we atta attacking, so to speak, being a false hearer? 
It's the false hearers who will rise up for themselves their own false teachers, suited for their own twisted desires, chasing after myths. So do we see this happening today. Well, of course, we see now more than ever, it seems, false teachers and teachings abound. They are all over the Internet. They are in brochures hung on your door. They come into the mail or in person knocking at your door or in the mouths of friends and relatives. False religions, false scriptures, false gospels, false Christs. They threaten the health of souls and capture unstable minds. It's always tragic when you hear of somebody who was a professing Christian make a change. And they want to tell you all about it. And they bring to your ears some strange things that differ with God's word. And it's a, it's a sad thing to witness. I've witnessed it personally several times. Um, we, be, we, we should be aware of those things. All Christians should be well trained in the truth to resist such things, especially pastors. But fighting the enemies uh, with, without, again, begins by fighting the enemy within. The battle begins in the heart. Remember, this danger was first in the hearts of the hearers. They could no longer endure healthy teaching and turned away. So be aware, yes, of false teaching, but more so be aware of the hidden evils of the heart to thirst after such things. That get tired of hearing what heaven can't get enough of. God's pure and unhindered word of truth, His glory revealed and His precious gospel obeyed. May God give us renewed and sustained and growing desire for such things. Beloved, we want to be faithful hearers. The pastor has a duty then to shepherd your souls in such a way, with such things in mind, to preach the word to you in season and out of season, those times you want to hear it and those times you don't want to hear it. He must be aware of these evils, these threats, these challenges and dangers as he reproves, rebukes, and exhorts, but with complete patience and teaching, with doctrine and with that which should accompany doctrine, godliness. He aims the word the pastor aims the word at you in grace and love, even when rebuking sin, even when correcting, saying things you don't want to hear. He aims the word at false teachings and false teachers to cut them off in faithful protection of the flock. John Calvin says the pastor ought to have two voices, one for gathering the sheep and another for warding off and driving away wolves and thieves. The scripture supplies him with the means of doing both. Again, faithful preaching demands total commitment because that's what's necessary to defeat threats. Second, let's consider from our passage what Timothy is, is exhorted to after mentioning these threats. He's again exhorted to, uh, he says, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And on... With this particular passage, I found the Amplified Bible helpful in these places. It says, But as for you, be clear-headed in every situation. Stay calm and cool and steady. Endure every hardship without flinching. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the duties of your ministry. The pastor then is to carry on. Fulfill his ministry, even when such times come. They must not retreat from the goal, but commit to the end. Even as apostasy increases, even as trends come and go, the pastor must stay faithful. Such faithfulness will fortify the church's defense line against attacks. Only this, by God's grace, will do the job. But it requires deep commitment to the charge. If you think about uh, the Great Wall of China, I know we've probably heard this before, it's a gigantic structure that costs an immense amount of money and labor. When it was finished, it appeared impregnable, but the enemy breached it. Not by breaking it down or going around it, they did it by bribing the gatekeepers. So pastors must be good gatekeepers in their preaching. They must guard their hearts. They must resist the temptation to capitulate, unlike the false teachers all around them. I mean, Paul starts naming names in this letter. This man started out well, but he's now opposing the gospel. This man who once comforted me, look out for him. He's not one of us. So there has to be, even in the midst of being surrounded by false teaching and false teachers, an awareness uh, to stay firm, to stay, to stay faithful. So then my challenge, uh, church, is just that we uh, keep this 
this view in mind, <clears throat> what is required of faithful preaching. Uh, that we would give heed to this duty of pastoral care, that, that it would be done faithfully, um, that we would have your prayers, and that you would come alongside and hold us accountable to such a high standard of teaching. Be the Bereans who search the scriptures to see if these things are true. Value the scriptures. You're not up here to see a man perform or to entertain or to give us really cool ideas. Hopefully you've come here wanting to, to hear the word preached. And then it would be faith building and strengthening. So pray that faithful preaching would be done in total commitment because that's what's required by God because that's what's needed by the church because that's what's necessary to defeat threats. And so I end with this. Uh, again, just hitting on this note, it is not just the preacher, but you, Christian, that must show total commitment. Commit yourself to the hearing and the, and the doing of God's preached word. Be faithful hearers of the word. Resist the temptation to turn back or to turn away from God's truth. Press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And remember the dangers without, but also remember the dangers within. There is a real temptation to think, oh, this is getting old. The things of God should never get old in that way. But it takes diligence, takes prayer, takes encouraging one another with the scriptures, seeking the power of the Holy Spirit, because God's word in truth is glorious. In reality, it's wonderful, and it sustains us. Um, and keep in mind judgment. We talked about judgment. Paul Washer says, We live between two great days, the day Christ hung before men, and the day all men will kneel before Christ. So, from the hymn Onward Christian Soldier, Onward Christian Soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus, going on before Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe, Forward into battle, see his banner go. So, Phoenix FBC, let us go onward, forward in faithfulness. Amen? Let's pray.